to uh, give you a very, very warm welcome on, on this very special day to Simon and Melissa. Melissa and Simon, welcome. And it's a formal occasion, but what I'd like you to do, and for everybody to do, is enjoy the service. Be relaxed and uh, throw yourselves in to this beautiful and ancient service of matrimony. Uh, a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Could I ask you all please to turn any mobile phone off? So we celebrate the sacrament of matrimony today. And we essentially, all of us here, come to pray for this couple that they will have the happiest of all lives together uh, as they begin something so beautiful and wonderful today. Now the first part of our service is rather wonderful. It's the candle ceremony. I now ask the mothers of Melissa and Simon to come forward to the altar and light the candles. The mothers come as representatives of two separate families, of Melissa and Simon as individuals. The flame in each candle burns with the warmth and love that have been nurtured in you by your families over the years. Sit for the introductory reading. The Art of Marriage. A good marriage must be created in marriage. The little things are big things. It has never been too old to hold hands. It is remembering to say, I love you, at least once a day. It is never going to sleep angry. It is having mutual sense of values and common objectives. It is standing together and facing the world. It is forming a circle of love that gathers in the whole family. It is speaking words of appreciation and demonstrating gratitude in thoughtful ways. It is having the capacity to forgive and forget. It has given each other an atmosphere in which each can grow. It is common search for the good and the beautiful. It is not only marrying the right person, it is being the right partner. A reading based on the letter, on the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Love is a very special and beautiful gift. It brings out the very best in people. Without it, we are nothing. Love has often been described in many various ways. It means something to each of us. Perhaps a good definition of it is a joyous feeling we experience as a result of a strong attachment to some. However, it, just, it does not just remain with us, but it is something we share with others in our daily lives. It is the basis of Christian faith. In order to receive love, one must love. Many people search for it all their lives. They are so busy trying to be loved that they often forget to love. Love is not restricted. It has no barriers. It is not always perfect, nor does it pretend to be. Love is bearing the good with the bad. It is being there when someone needs you. It means saying a comforting word in times of stress. Love is something sacred and it should be cherished. It is also the basis of any strong relationship. It is present between husband and wife, parents and their children, sisters and brothers, relatives and friends. It is everywhere. We must try to always reach out to those around us. Christ showed us how to love. Love has no end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let 
There's a reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. If I have all the eloquence of men or angels, but speak without love, I am simply a gong booming or a cymbal clashing. If I have the gift of prophecy, understanding all the mysteries there are, and knowing everything, and I have faith in all its fullness to move mountains, but without love, then I am nothing at all. If I give away all that I possess, piece by piece, and if I even let them take my body to burn it, but am without love, it will do me no good whatever. Love is always patient and kind. It is never jealous. Love is never boastful or conceited. It is never rude or selfish. It does not take offence and it is not resentful. Love takes no pleasure in other people's sins but delights in the truth. It is always ready to excuse, to trust, to hope and to endure whatever comes. Love does not come to an end, but if there are gifts of prophecy, the time will come when they must fail, or the gift of languages. It would not continue forever, and knowledge, for this too, the time will come when it must fail. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophesying imperfect, but once perfection comes, all imperfect things will disappear. When I was a child, I used to talk like a child, and think like a child, and argue like a child. But now that I am a man, all childish ways are put behind me. Now we are seeing a dim reflection in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. The knowledge that I have now is imperfect, but then I shall know as fully as I am known. In short, there are three things that last, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. wasn't uh, aware of the little candle ceremony uh, that you've introduced to this wedding. And there they are. Three candles, soon to be united into one, both marked love. And that's very much the theme of this service. I love weddings. I think it's the, it's, it's the bestest thing I do. Uh, because they're such happy occasions, the beginning of so much, the rich potential all here today, and two lovely people come together to uh, be blessed in their love, to celebrate their love. The candle got me thinking, though. Fire it is used a lot as an image or as a symbol of love, uh, a symbol of, of, of something special. In a few months' time, uh, London hosts the Olympics. And at the opening ceremony, uh, some big tough guy or lady will run up to the great torch in the stadium at Wembley. Uh, not Wembley, the other place. And, uh, <laughs> and, and a great fire will light up in, in the east of London as the Olympic uh, torch is lit. And uh, it'll be a sign of what the, uh, the founders of the modern Olympics wanted, that the world comes together, not in love, in a soppy sense, but in a way in sport intensive. We're all coming together to share our humanity and to try and achieve a unity. So that great torch will be a flame symbolizing the aspirations of us human beings to make a better world of it. Flames, though, sometimes have to put up with wind and rain. Uh, we 
just praying that that rain will hold off as we leave the church. But in life, Melissa, Simon, you'll find your little flame there will be blown around. There'll be days when it's raining and it'll just have difficulty in remaining alight. There'll be days too, I have to tell you, there'll be days when it'll be a bit dark. It'll be a bit, where's the sunshine gone? And that's true for all of us. Whatever we are, married or not, the days when it's hard. We just can't see things. And the flame is there. And in the sacrament of marriage, we turn to the Lord to keep it always alight. There are false flames all over the place, false lights. My last job was the Royal Navy, and uh, my ship arrived in Cutterball in Sydney. And uh, I was taken for a run ashore down to King's Cross in Sydney. An experience for a chap. <laughs> A lot of uh, bright lights, you know, uh, Tesco's, and, uh, <laughs> bright lights, false lights, enticing you in the wrong direction. Today, our flame is actually about this light. This is the great Paschal candle of the church, lit at Easter. The priest blesses the Easter fire and lights the Paschal candle. And we all come into the church, which is darkened, following the light. But Jesus said, I am the light of the world. It's my love, my spirit that fills the world. And when our lights grow dim, when we're in trouble, when we're having difficulty with our spluttering lights to keep going, we turn to the light that is Christ in our world and in our marriage. So when things get rough, go to the boss. Don't go to false lights. Don't go to all the many glitzy things around that are not flame. They're just cheap imitations of real fire, real love, real love. For that's what we're talking about today, the real McCoy, the real thing. And uh, the light of Christ in your lives is a place to go to reignite always your own love for each other. Because the greatest teacher that ever lived taught us that it's only when we give, when we share, that we become truly happy. When our lives are like a clenched, closed fist, Something in us dies, the flame goes out. When we open to others, and especially in marriage, the great height and summit of human relationships, when we're both open to each other, then we grow and are flooded with light and joy and happiness. And life then is so rich and so wonderful. So, let your hands be open today to receive the light into your souls. May that light shine brightly all through your lives. Amen. Amen. Now, do you want to get married? <laughs> yes. Let's do it. Come on up. So, Melissa and Simon, you have come together in this church so that the Lord may seal and strengthen your love in the presence of the church's minister and this community. Christ abundantly blesses this love. He has already consecrated you in baptism, and now he enriches and strengthens you by a special sacrament so that you may assume the duties of marriage in mutual and lasting fidelity. And so in the presence of the church, I ask you now to state your intentions. Simon and Melissa, I shall now ask you if you freely undertake the obligations of marriage, 
and to state that there is no legal impediment to your marriage. Are you ready freely and without reservation to give yourselves to each other in marriage? I am. Are you ready to love and honour each other as man and wife for the rest of your lives? I am. Are you ready to accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? I am. I am. I do solemnly declare. I do solemnly declare that I know not. That I know not of any lawful impediment. Of any lawful impediment. Why I, Simon David John Joyce. Why I, Simon David John Joyce. May not be joined in matrimony may not be joined in matrimony to Melissa Veronica de Silva. To Melissa Veronica de Silva. I do solemnly declare I do solemnly declare that I know not that I know not of any lawful impediment of any lawful impediment I Melissa Veronica de Silva. Why I Melissa Veronica de Silva may not be joined in matrimony may not be joined in matrimony to Simon David John Joyce. To Simon David John Joyce. Since it is your intention to enter into marriage, declare your consent before God and his church. Simon David John Joyce, will you take Melissa Veronica de Silva here present for your lawful wife according to the right of our Holy Mother the Church? I will. Melissa Veronica de Silva, will you take Simon David John Joyce here present for your lawful husband according to the right of our Holy Mother the Church? I will. Each other, we do. Come a little closer to me. It's great. I call upon these persons. I call upon these persons. Here present to witness. Here present to witness. That I, Simon David John Joyce. That I, Simon David John Joyce. Do take the. To, Melissa Veronica de Silva. To take thee, Melissa Veronica de Silva. To be my lawful wedded wife. To be my lawful wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. Sickness and in health. Sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Break for a moment. Now rejoin. I call upon these persons. I call upon these persons. Here present to witness. Here present to witness. That I, Melissa Veronica de Silva. That I, Melissa Veronica de Silva. Do take the Simon David John Joyce. Do take the Simon David John Joyce. To be my lawful wedded husband. To be my lawful wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better for worse. For better for worse. For richer for poorer. For richer for poorer. Sickness and in health. Sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us. Till death do us part. Just face me a minute. You have declared your consent before the church. May the Lord in his goodness strengthen your consent and fill you both with his blessings. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless these rings which you will give to each other as the sign of your love and fidelity. Melissa. Melissa. Take this ring. Take this ring. It's a sign of my love and fidelity. It's a sign of my love and fidelity. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. You say it. In the name of the Father. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and of the Son. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Your turn now. Simon. 
Simon. Take this ring. Take this ring. As a sign of my love and fidelity. As a sign of my love and fidelity. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Melissa and Simon, I now ask you to please take up the candles that your mothers lit earlier. These candles represent each of you as individuals as you join the two candles together to light a single marriage candle. The flames fla flare higher than before. This flame of love symbolizes how Melissa and Simon's lives, loves and lives will be richer in their union. The united flame is a powerful symbol representing the warmth of Melissa and Simon's love and the sacredness of their relationship. It is a lamp that will guide them through every day of their future together. For Melissa and Simon, now beginning their life together, that they may receive divine assistance through the constant support of their family and friends, the rich blessings of children, a warm love reaching out to others, and good health until ripe old age. Let us pray to the Lord. For the parents and family of Melissa and Simon, that they continue to lead by example, and support them on their journey that has started here today. Let us pray to the Lord. May the family and friends of Melissa and Simon, who have been so much a part of their lives, receive God's abundant blessing for their love, care, concern and understanding. Let us pray to the Lord. For the family and friends who are no longer with us and are now at rest in the Lord, May they enjoy perfect happiness and total fulfilment in eternal life. Let us pray to the Lord. For Melissa and Simon, that their lives will be filled with joy and peace, that their love will go from strength to strength, and their deepest hopes on this day will come to fulfilment. Let us pray to the Lord. So we pray, Lord, we who have shared in this celebration of love between man and woman, pray that Melissa and Simon be always close to one another. May their love for each other proclaim to all the world their faith in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before I give the blessing, just a word of congratulation. I don't think a little bit. It'd be good to have a little bit. Eternal Father, keep you in love for each other so that the peace of Christ may stay with you and be always in your home. Amen. May you always bear witness to the love of God in the world so that the afflicted and the needy will find you generous friends and welcome you into the joys of heaven. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you and keep you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless now.
I've got a lot of dress. Do I go in the front or do I go in the back? No, you want to go in the back, you plank. Come on, mate, what's the matter with you? You can't sit in the front of me. Do what you want, hun. I just realised I just called you a plank and I think this thing's filming us.
finally, ladies and gentlemen, for the main event, for the very first time together as husband and wife, please make a very, very loud noise for Mr. and Mrs. Joyce. Okay, can we please put your hands together and give a massive warm welcome to the father of the bride, Tilak! Thank you. Let me start by saying, Melissa, you have always looked beautiful to me, but today, as a bride, you have blown me away. You're simply gorgeous. And Sai, you look very sharp. <laughs> <laughs> when Mel and Sai told us they were engaged, it was one of the happiest days of our lives. <clears throat> Until they told me I had to do a speech. <laughs> Since then, I have had wobbly knees and nightmares <laughs> until today. With the help of alcohol, who has <laughs> helped me start to stand here tonight. I'm glad that you have all made it to the reception hall. This is the first time in my life that so many people paying attention to me <laughs> all at once. When Melissa left to London some years ago, the only advice we gave her was not to get involved with anyone from overseas, <laughs> as it is not easy to have a long distance relationship. But the only thing she actually did was to find Simon. When Melissa rang home to tell us her good news, only thing she said was, Dad, you like him. <laughs> so she did not give any other details about Simon. <laughs> we met Simon a few weeks later when he visited us in Australia. We all liked him very much and felt very comfortable with Simon as if we had already known him for a while. But looking up to him, <laughs> I knew he was going to be a pain in the neck. <laughs> And then a year later, I met his dad. <laughs> and he was even a bigger pain in the neck. <laughs> Melissa, even though I have given you away to Simon in marriage, you will always be my little girl. We are very happy that you found Simon, whom we all love very much. Talking about little girls, some of my memories of Melissa as a little girl is watching DVD cartoons together on and on. Melissa on my lap, drinking her, drinking her bottle of milk. Even though times have long passed since then, you have not changed much. <laughs> the recent cricket match in Sydney we watched together. For every beer you got me, you had two glasses of vodka. <laughs> It seems we still like watching together things and your drinking hasn't changed. Just milk, a, just milk to vodka. And I still have to pay for it. We didn't pressure Sai and Mel to get married. We just passed subtle hints about our ages when we got married and started a family how young we were. Now we don't want to pressure them to start a family. <laughs> we just bought a cot and a pram as part of their wedding gift. 
with a one year warranty, which I hope you will use before it runs out. <laughs> the most important people here today are the newly married couple. And we should not forget the two mothers who have dressed up for the occasion and look beautiful. They also dress up at other times when they are together. Now let me thank everyone for being here today to celebrate the wedding of our daughter Melissa to Simon. Many of you have come here all the way from Australia to be with us. We are truly blessed to have family and friends both in Australia and have, who have made a special effort to be here. To the locals, I know it is a working day and thanks for taking the day off. We would also like to thank all our relatives, friends and Simon's family for their hospitality during our stay in the past few weeks. I would like to extend a special thank to Tessa and Dave's, Simon's parents, for their wonderful hospitality during our stay and for their support and generosity with planning this wedding, especially for letting us take Simon back to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have had the honor to walk Mel down the aisle, give her away, and have the first dance. There's someone who deserves much more recognition than me. It's my wife, Celine. Celine Devotes. <laughs> Celine devotes her life to her family, and we wouldn't be the family we are today if not wasn't for her. We appreciate everything you have done, and I just want to especially thank you, Celine. To Simon, thanks for being you. You are a wonderful man, and we wouldn't think of a better son-in-law. You are perfect for Mel, and we have never seen Mel so happy. To Mel and Sam, the love of our lives, thank you so much for all the years of happiness you have given us, and expect many more to come. Mel and Sai, don't ever forget, we will be there for both of you with whatever comes your way in the future. Now I would like to raise a toast for everyone. I would, I would like to end with the toast to the couple. Please stand with your glass of bubbly for the toast. We wish Melissa and Simon many wonderful years of happiness together. Melissa and Simon love and look after each other and be there for each other and to Mel and Simon. Thank you. Let's have a really big round of applause for Tilak, everyone. That was absolutely brilliant. Well done, Tilak. And he told me he was nervous before he did that. Unbelievable. Well done. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the next speech for, the, uh, for this afternoon. Can I please introduce the man of the day, Simon Joyce. Thank you, Troy. Doing a great job as Toastmaster. Tilak, thank you so much for a lovely speech. I think you'll all agree, Tilak completely nailed it. Yes. Well, hopefully you can hear firsthand that I've retained my UK accent after four years away from the UK. Yes. I'm sure any of the, uh, the English contingent here will pick me up with any uh, frustrating Aussieisms that the rest of the group um, do come across, some of which um, I'll, I'll summarise. One of them, too easy. <laughs> the other one, instead of how are you doing or how, how are you, how are you going? So please, if, if, if I do say any of these things during the speech, please pick me up. Please pick me up. And if I do say these things, Mel, we might need to address our future home, which is currently Australia. 
That's that. Aussies aside, I'd actually love, a, I'd love to have a Sri Lankan accent. It'd be brilliant, but e easier said than done, I think, so. So to start, pretty much echoing um, some of Tilak's kind words on behalf of my wife, Mel, and I would like to start by thanking you all for being here today. As Tilak said, so many of you have travelled far and wide from across the world, from Australia, so many um, of Mel's fr friends and family, such a long way to go, such a big expense, such a long way, and also Aaron from New York. Aaron's in here somewhere. Um, so it means, it means a great deal for us to, to have you all here today and sh share, a, share our special day with us. So thanks very much, guys. Superb. <laughs> Tilak and Selena, of course, Sammy. I'd like to thank you for the warmest welcome into the, the Silver household. Um, it was never going to be easy leaving my family and friends in this country to move country and, you know, st st start again over in Australia. But I couldn't have asked for a warmer welcome um, from day one. Maybe actually not literally from day one. Celine, you terrified me with your screening of me at the airport. <laughs> you literally looked me head to toe before it even spoke. So that was, that was very scary. Um, I think I passed that test, did I? That was test one. Test two was um, on day two, um, breakfast round the, the, the silvers when the super hot uh, Sri Lankan super dried chilies came out for breakfast. So, of course, I had to lay down the gauntlet and um, show that I had a high spice tolerance, which I think I did so, even if it meant tears rolling down my face um, and other hidden, hidden pain. So, I think I, I think I passed that test too. Um, I'd also like to thank you for giving me the, your blessing to marry your beautiful daughter, Mel. I promise to take good care of Mel, and I hope I'll be everything you'd expect for in a son-in-law. So, thank you. Now, without encroaching on the best man's content, Vaughny, I think it's important to start from the beginning and maybe ex reiterate or explain how we got here today and, and, and the route that we took. So, um... Let's set the scene. We're in southwest London, affluent south southwest London. <laughs> Although the Inferno's website positions the club as London's greatest disco, <laughs> internet reviews do paint a slightly different picture. <laughs> One reviewer, and this is a genuine, genuine quote, source viewlondon.co.uk. <laughs> I, I quote. Inferno's is hugely popular with all recently graduated London, Londoners looking for a very messy night out. And of course, the good chance of picking up some form of male or female lying on the dance floor. <laughs> on first impressions, it looked like a half decent nightclub that sold cocktails. Got to the club on New Year's Eve, found dormant friendly and didn't have to wait that long. There's not many people at the door. Great start but got in and suddenly was hit by the most horrible, sweaty smell ever known to mankind. It actually smelled cheesy and of old, overworn running trainers. I wasn't sure how the smell was in the building until my friend said it was the carpet. It hadn't been washed. My friend asked me to feel the carpet with my shoe. I did, and he was right. It was very, very sticky and greasy and from what I could see, hadn't been cleaned for ages. Interesting view. <laughs> I know my best man, Vaughan, would disagree with that view. He only has good things to say about the place. After all, it was the only place Vaughan could pick up, pick up in those days. <laughs> you get the mic soon, Vaughan. Sorry. And of course, my brother Mike and my sister-in-law Gina, another Inferno's couple. Nothing wrong with Inferno's, is there? <laughs> Father, uh, we're two, two beautiful boys, Joshua and Lucas, so another, another Inferno's couple there. <laughs> so the scene's been set. I'm upstairs, I'm on the main dance floor in Inferno's, and I see this attractive Sri Lankan girl who's gorgeous, but she's caught me off guard and put me in a somewhat confusing mindset. Before we even establish eye contact or exchange words, I'm definitely in a state of confusion. On the one hand, I'm transfixed by her sheer beauty, but then I'm in utter shock and confusion over her bizarre and disturbing dance style. 
I know that she's attempting the running man dance. I know that much, but the technique is just so flawed. I think I'm gonna have to show you how it goes, aren't I? I'm gonna have to show you. Catch your breath. <laughs> Is that good, Brooks? That, that's good lightliness. Okay, so you're now with me. You can share the awkwardness of the moment. You can appreciate that I can only tolerate a few more moments of this terrible dance. So I approach Mel, I make the move. I express my disappointment and, of course, show her how it's done, how the runner man should dance. Should dance. Sorry. Mel will definitely show you her mastered dance later on. Catch my breath. <laughs> I am, seriously. <laughs> now, I'd love to say that the rest is history, but just when you, th you were thinking that the romance had peaked in this evening, I do need to continue with relaying the next highly rom romantic episode of the evening. At this point, my wingman, Vaughnie, had left the club. He was tucking into his variety meal go large at the neighbouring KFC. <laughs> That was our problem with Infernos, it closed too early and there were no other, no other later options in the area. So it's ironic really that after two years of hitting London's greatest disco on a weekly basis, it took an Australian tourist in the name of Melissa De Silva to introduce me to an equally classy venue, Post Infernos. And so our journey of romance continued. Mel led me to a venue only minutes away, which can only be described as a curry house turned nightclub. <laughs> yeah. We danced with our feet cracking on the leftover poppadoms and samosas. <laughs> and as the smell of chicken vindaloo wafted through the air, I looked over at Mel, who was dancing on the curry stained tables, <laughs> drinking warm white wine out of the bottle. And I thought to myself, I'm going to marry this girl. <laughs> In all seriousness, Mel, my bride, you've made me incredibly happy. You look absolutely stunning today. Your endless joy, positive nature and sheer enthusiasm for life definitely brings out the best side of me. Those who know me will know how lost and unhappy I was when we were apart at the start of our relationship, when we, were, when we were on other sides of the world, when it was tough times back then. Just after a few weeks, I knew you were the one for me, Mel. Mel, I love you very much. Thank you for marrying me and making me the happiest man alive. So some big thank yous to make Mum and Dad Joyce. Thank you so much for all your support and help with making today happen. Planning a wedding from another, another country is not easy. But you naturally slotted into the unofficial wedding planner role with us sending you on various missions throughout the period, scouting the different uh, reception venues, including this one, and also looking into the various church, churches. So thanks very much. Appreciate that very much. Then came the 1am phone call from Sydney with the Mel UK visa curveball, <laughs> which resulted in you both jumping out of bed at 1am and getting on the phone to Heathrow Terminal 3 to make the various phone calls. So that's, that's superb, thanks so much. I'd also like to thank you on a broader scale for my upbringing. <laughs> it's, it's not meant to be funny, but I'll roll with that. <laughs> And your support through the years, I'm truly grateful for everything you've done for me. We've got you a little something for you both.
Moving on, so we were talking about other unofficial wedding planners. Special thank you to Sammy, the maid of honour. <laughs> Sammy spent hours trawling the web during her so-called job in London <laughs> and making calls to set up the reception tour along with other major duties during the planning process. We actually have Sammy to thank, you, to thank for finding this wonderful venue. Sammy found it online, superb. Sammy, it's obvious the strong bond you and Mel have, and I know that she loves you very much. Sammy, I feel honoured to call you my new sister-in-law. Thank you very much. We've got a little something for you. Sounds like a song, like a rap. Selena and Tilak, we owe you a huge thank you for your heavy support in, in planning and even salvaging our wedding day. The venue is beautiful, we're having a great time. When the dreaded Mel UK visa news landed, within minutes, you jumped in the car from Canberra, made the four hour drive down to see us, spent hours with the local vicar to get the, um, get the, to get the wedding back on track. You then jumped back in the car at 4 a.m. to drive straight to work the next day. This means so much for us. Thank you, thank you so much. I think we rely on you too much. <laughs> and then we have a separate Canberra celebration on our return to Australia. A big, big celebration with 100 guests. Um, Sydney and Tillac have been behind the scenes doing all the planning for that. So we're truly grateful and really looking forward to that separate celebration. We've got you a, a couple of presents too. Shouldn't one of the others just be doing this job? <laughs> Half, where are you? <laughs> Selena, I know where Mel gets her selfless and care inside from, not so much your cooking, unfortunately. <laughs> And Tilak, you are by far the most patient person I know. I'm in awe of your patience. And also your rhythm and dance moves, which I can't, cannot wait to see on the dance floor some, soon, in a few, few minutes. My ushers, I'm honoured to have you by my side today. Wado, where are you? Thank you for flying over and being here today and organising my Aussie stag do in Sydney. Wade's only here for about four days, so he's probably, he'll probably be jet-lagged the whole time and he'll probably be in bed in about two hours, so keep an eye on him. Um, as I said, thank you for organising my Sydney stag do, even though I was out on the stag night for a full seven hours later than you, Wade. What happened there? <laughs> Seriously though, Wade, thanks for being a great mate and my token Aussie buddy, I need at least one. My English ushers, Harv, Thatch, MJ and Arch. Then we have Troy Bennett, Toastmaster. I officially crown you head usher. Please can you make your way over here for the official crowning. Troy went above and beyond across all duties, including attending the Marbella Stag, leaven his uh, four-week-year-old four newborn at home with Joe. Sorry again, Joe, for that. Troy Bennett, come here for your crowning. Bend down, bend down. There you go. Flowers to you. There we go, mate. Doing a great job, Toastmaster. Thanks to our drivers, Woz, Harvey, Barnsey. We're very lucky to have friends and family with fancy cars. It meant, it meant a lot to be driven by you guys today. Appreciate it. I'm nearly done. Vaughny, are you ready? <laughs> Last but not least, we were lucky enough for a very close friend to photograph us this morning. Special thanks to Back Beck for capturing those, those special moments. We've got a little something for you. So before I hand over to Vaughny, my wife would actually say, like to say a few words. <laughs> Melissa. Um, 
I know it's not really traditional for a bride to make a speech, but I really wanted to take this opportunity to say a few thank yous. I promise to keep it short, as I'm sure you're all eagerly awaiting Tom's best man speech. With our family and friends living on opposite sides of the world, words cannot express how much it means to us to have you all here today in one room. We are so very grateful to everyone who has travelled to be here, especially all the Aussies. We feel so touched that you have all made such an effort and having you here has made this day so special. I can't thank you enough. To my bridesmaids, Brooke, Tan and Mish, it has really meant so much to me to have my best mates by my side, not only today, but over the years. Thank you so much for all your support and friendship. To my new family, the Joyces, <laughs> from the first time I met you, you have all made me feel a part of your family. The enormous amount of support and generosity you have given us has meant the world to me, and I'm so honoured to now be a Joyce. <laughs> to my maid of honour, Sammy, my sister and my best friend, even though I'm four years, four years older than you, I look up to you in so many ways. We have been through everything together, and it's so good to know that you will always be there for me no matter what. I can't thank you enough for being such an amazing sister. Mum and Dad, you have supported me through every stage of my life and without you both, I would not be where I am today. I have never known such generous and loving people who would literally do anything for me and Sammy. I am so grateful for all the sacrifices you have made for us. The encouragement and support you have given me has made me who I am. Although I'm sure I've given you a few grey hairs along the way. I would just like to take a special moment to, to oh, sorry, take, take a moment to make a special thanks to my mum, who is honestly the most amazing woman. You have been my rock, and it's hard to put into words what you have given me. But I am so extremely grateful for everything. I know if I become even half the woman you are, my kids will be extremely lucky, and so will I. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't finish this speech without mentioning my new husband, Sai. You mean the world to me, and I'm so excited to be your wife and spend the rest of my life with you. So back to Sai. <laughs> Thanks, Mel. Lovely, lovely words. And now the main event, Tom Vaughan. But not, not, not quite yet. <laughs> Vaughny, seriously, I'm truly grateful to have such a solid, reliable and entertaining best mate. <laughs> Thank you for organising a flawless and epic Marbella stag trip. <laughs> Some of the boys feeling back that it, their, that it was their best ever trip in their lifetime. That's legendary stuff, Vaughny. So, of course, now Vaughan is going to come up here and go after me and expose me as, as groom, try and stitch me up. Before he gets here, I'd just like to ask you all to take what he says with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Vaughan is a city boy, a city slicker, a high flyer. <laughs> and with his current job title, namely, this is, this is a real job title, it's on his signatures, on his emails, Structured Credit and Derivatives Director... We have to assume that Vaughan has the art of bullshitting down to a T. <laughs> Vaughan is professionally trained in public speaking, though, so you are in for an absolute belter. <laughs> Before I go, just one more thing. Just want to leave you with this image. This, after a standard, standard night out at Inferno's, is my best mate, Tom Vaughan! <laughs> Cheers. Well done, Joycey. Let's give everyone, let's give uh, Joycey and Mel a really big round of applause for two amazing speeches. Really well done, guys. Thank you. And they were lovely, but let's really get on to the main event of what we really want to hear about. Can I please introduce to you Simon Joyce's best man, Tom Vaughan. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Simon. Um, and Simon, thank you very much for that generous introduction. Um, 
I wasn't totally expecting that picture, and I, I don't actually have a great defense to it, um, other than I toyed with two speeches uh, for today. Uh, one was titled, Safe, uh, and one was titled, Not So Safe, and I pretty much know which one I'm going to opt for now. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, before we discuss Simon, uh, could I take this opportunity to comment on how much uh, the lovely bridesmaids have done to support Mel today. Um, they've all come a long way. Uh, Sammy, uh, Michelle, Brooke, Tanya. And uh, I think you'll all agree, like everything else about the wedding today, uh, look absolute perfection. So if you could be upstanding, and we shall toast the bridesmaids. Okay. For those who don't know our background, uh, I first met Simon at school. And I had the experience of living with him in London as we started our careers for the best part of four years after university. More on that later. But when Simon first asked me to be best man, I was, of course, honoured and humbled, especially knowing how many good mates Simon has from both home, university, and now in Australia. However, should I have been in any doubt how honoured I should be, Simon made it very clear during that drunken call, which lasted about an hour, <laughs> that if I wasn't 100% committed, there was a strong list of contenders. <laughs> and plenty of people desperate to step up to it. So Simon, do not worry. I made full use of that list when collating the not so safe material for this speech. So as most of you know, Simon and Mel will continue to make a life for themselves in Australia after this wedding. I have heard Australia referred to as the lucky country. What with its warm climate, good standard of living, and fantastic beaches. But I was wondering, with Simon now emigrating there, would Australia and Mel be lucky to receive Simon in return? <laughs> We're nearly about to start, don't worry. <laughs> Many people move to Australia because of the key skills they bring. After finishing school, Simon decided to take a year out. But rather than use this time to broaden the mind through charitable work or travelling, Simon decided to take on a number of key apprenticeships. The first one was at Sports Division. <laughs> For those that don't know, Sports Division was a world leader in underpriced, shoddy sports gear and appalling customer service. <laughs> Simon excelled at the latter. <laughs> Moping around the front of the shop, not engaging customers or fellow staff and basically doing everything he could to avoid being helpful. <laughs> Unfortunately, following a change in strategy by the business owners, this profile was no longer required and a dismissal followed soon after. <laughs> Simon also struggled with authority at his other job as a cleaner <laughs> at the Oracle building on the Sutton Seeds Industrial Estate. It was unfortunate that every time Simon's manager checked on progress in his section, he was never there. <laughs> this unfortunate coincidence led to several written warnings, and I think Simon came to realise that leaving school to go straight to work was probably not his destiny. So Australia, unfortunately, will not be receiving a key tradesman. <laughs> but fear not. Simon merely took this as an opportunity to reinvent himself. And following the summer, he enrolled at Bournemouth University. Simon wanted to become an academic. <laughs> Simon started this passage of life studying for a business and technology degree, clearly with lofty ambitions of being the next Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. Unfortunately, Simon is rubbish with computers or anything remotely technical. A technology degree was therefore probably not the wisest choice. So rather than concentrating on his programming skills, 
programming skills, most of the first term was spent pleading with the faculty to change courses, <laughs> managing, managing to eventually transfer onto a media course that allowed him to watch loads more TV and class it as research. <laughs> However, this was not the only hurdle Simon faced in completing his studies. The first of these occurred when Simon was walking home with some friends after a couple of beers, when they came across a newspaper stand outside the local newsagent. This was timely, as recently Simon had started working out <laughs> and was very keen to show off his new strength by lifting the newspaper stand. <laughs> Incredibly, Simon managed to lift the stand all the way to chest height, an incredible achievement. Unfortunately, the awkward shape was not something he had prepared for in the gym, and it forced his centre of gravity backwards, ending up with Simon falling through the agent's window with the newspaper stand still being held. <laughs> Another incident occurred in the local KFC <laughs> after another night on the town. You know, while sober, Simon is normally very happy to abide by normal social conventions, <laughs> such as waiting your turn in the queue when ordering food. Unfortunately, Simon, when he's had a few drinks, can find it difficult to remember how these unwritten rules operate. When walking into KFC, Simon was convinced there was an express counter for the seriously hammered. <laughs> and Julie walked right to the front to order. When Simon is convinced he is morally correct, it can be hard to dissuade him. And this unfortunately caused some debate with the security staff. Luckily, a couple of friendly bear hugs from some innocent bystanders avoid, allowed everyone to leave safely although Simon remains the only person we've ever met to receive a banning order from a fast food restaurant. <laughs> Simon also did his best at university to integrate with his fellow students, but soon fell into the wrong crowd. <laughs> None more so when he, along with certain characters in this room, wandered into their hall's kitchen where a large selection of birthday cakes had been left for one of their dorm mates by his visiting mum. Fair to say, those cakes were not there when that young chap went back in to celebrate his birthday. In addition, it is rumoured that this bad crowd Simon was now mixing with were responsible for terrorising the foreign students by wearing masks from the film Scream and asking them, what's your favourite scary movie? So it was with great regret that Simon felt that this life of academia was not meant to be. And instead, he quickly turned his attention to becoming a successful media executive in London. It was during this period that Simon and I shared a house. It was also during this time that Simon began to exhibit certain efficiencies in the way he led his home life, clearly born out of the fast-paced city lifestyle he was now experiencing. The first of these related to Simon's approach to security. It was clear to Simon that having to open and then close the front door when he went to work made no sense. <laughs> For every time he came home, he would simply have to open and then close that same door again. So ingeniously, Simon decided that he, if he just left the door open, this ineffective process would be removed. In addition, I would benefit greatly from this new arrangement when I returned home from work, a double win. Simon's, Simon's second strategy related to his laundry process. In our house, frustratingly, the washing machine existed on the ground floor in the kitchen, whilst our wardrobes that housed our clothes were on the first floor in our bedrooms. This caused Simon much angst. Of course, it simply made no sense to take dirty clothes all the way down to the ground floor to be washed, only to then take them all the way back up the stairs to hang up again. No, Instead, Simon decided that post-washing his clothes, he would simply just dump them on the dining room table, which over time grew to such an extent, the entire area had to be decommissioned from other uses. <laughs> this process suited Simon perfectly, although the sight of Simon in the mornings walking into the lounge with just yesterday's underpants on whilst he fished for the day's wear did make holding my breakfast down somewhat difficult. <laughs> I also remember fondly how Simon used to make his way home along our road to the house after a night out. 
Many of you may wake up in the mornings to find paw prints on your cars where the local cats have been lying down overnight. On our street, the paw prints tended to be a little larger, <laughs> size 10 to be precise. That's because cars represented an obstacle for Simon in reaching the front door. And again, walking around them just made no sense. So instead, he would simply walk across them, allowing him to maintain his straight walking line home, which usually ended with a Frosby flip over the neighbor's garden hedge. But as well as creating domestic bliss at home, Simon was also forging ahead with his career in the city. Whilst working at his first media agency, Simon created a number of methods to boost productivity. The first one was his approach to Monday mornings. It was quite typical for Simon after a heavy weekend not to be in the best of moods, getting up to go to work. So rather than risk demoralizing his fellow co-workers by allowing them to get caught up with his sentiment, it was not uncommon for Simon to sit at his desk all morning until lunchtime with his large bomber jacket on. <laughs> this sent a clear sign to all those who worked with me, do not approach me, I'm not ready to talk to any other human, and this benefited everyone to focus on their morning activities. In later years, as his career developed, Simon found ever-increasing ways to make use of office space. He began to realize that after a night out, traveling home from the city took away unnecessary time that could be spent sleeping. So instead of this, Simon would just make his way back around the corner to the office, where he would bed down in reception on the comfy sofas, pull up the drinking machine so he had a fresh supply of mineral water, and lie there safe in the knowledge he had a full-time security guard in the building at all times. Another great benefit of this was the early morning call to Domino's could be made from the office phone, saving him vital phone credits. <laughs> so clearly this was a strong period for Simon. His career was taking flight. His approach to city living was unrivaled. However, even this was not enough, and following yet another Saturday night in Infernos, Simon declared that there was nothing left for London to offer him, and instead he needed a new adventure. It was 2006, and Simon decided that now was the time to go travelling. I decided to look up on the internet why people decide to go traveling. The most common reasons seem to be broadening, broadening your mind to new and different cultures and meeting lots of new people. I was keen to understand whether Simon had indeed embraced these objectives and come back a wiser and more rounded person. So I spoke to his traveling buddy, Ferg, who gave me an overview of key events as they traveled through South Asia. Ferg wrote, Simon can be a bit of a handful when traveling, as I'm sure most people could guess. He held anyone in contempt if they mentioned what a good time that they were having, or if they'd visited a really great place. <laughs> he referred to almost any other traveler who dared to be friendly or strike up a conversation to talk about activities or places they had visited as deluded. <laughs> in the end, he just decided to tell people he wasn't traveling and that he just wasn't like them. It was hilarious to see people react to his negative take on travelling, leading more than a few people to actually ask why he bothered at all. <laughs> Simon was keen to prove his point that he was not one of them by carrying a massive DVD player with him everywhere he went. <laughs> that DVD player made it through more countries than a lot of people see in a lifetime. No one really understood why he had it with him, but I think that was the point for him. His, his dedication to refusing to research anywhere we were going was also a delight to watch unravel. There was one embarrassing conversation I witnessed him having with a couple whilst in Australia. They were discussing the Whit Sundays, and Simon thought it was a nightclub. <laughs> there was literally only one place the whole time that he had any interest in visiting at all. And that was a bar called The Hobbit House in the Philippines. <laughs> a bar that is staffed only by dwarfs. <laughs> Obviously, we found that place. The look on his face as we entered the door just said, yes, this is what I'm here for. Another moment of note was when we touched down in Kuala Lumpur, where he had his first physical breakdown. We had to book into the first motel we came across, which was utterly dreadful because Simon started to feel unwell. 
Little did I know, because of this, I'd be stuck in that awful room for the best part of a week. He literally wouldn't move because he was scared of a potential accident en route to another venue. In the end, I was begging him to try and battle through so we could move to a nicer place, and that took me about five days. Another great thing about Simon is that he spends a good percentage of his time broken and moaning about how hungover he is. I lost count of the amount of times I had to go out and do things by myself the day after a session. Simon would stay in whatever apartment we were in with the lights off for the whole day in pieces. Simon, he can be a big man in the evening, but an utter wimp the next day. Once in New Zealand, we were in a hostel when he was hungover, and he decided to treat the shared hostel, hostel room like his own. And he had the majority of his luggage strewn about the place, including the DVD player, only to have a small group of German women walk in and start screaming at him for the mess. His response was, whatever, and just rolled over and waited for them to leave. <laughs> when Simon did make new friends, I have to say they were dubious. I left him alone in an Australian airport when we were en route to New Zealand. And when I came back, I found out he'd struck up a conversation with Michael Barrymore. <laughs> After convincing us he had a friend in the car hire business that wouldn't need documents, he gave us his number. A couple of days later, Simon convinced me we should call him up. Obviously, Barry Moore invited us over to his place. I wasn't convinced, but Simon thought it would be a good story. Fur concludes, the less said about that evening, the better. <laughs> so Simon certainly gains a lot from his travelling experience, but maybe not in the way others do. But this is typical of Simon and one of his great attributes. He does things his own way and isn't taken in by the crowd. However, this was almost his undoing when he met Mel. You see, Simon has kept out a key fact of when he and Mel first met. When Simon came back from travelling, he was probably a little lost. His journey had come full circle and he wasn't too sure of his next move, if any. On the night that they met, I was pushing for him to go to Inferno's but Simon was adamant he wasn't going. The only way he was prepared to go was if I paid for him. <laughs> I don't know why I did that, given that I had, at the time, a now ex-girlfriend, uh, although looking back, I probably did, uh, but that is what happened. I even remember paying my entry fee and walking into the club, not thinking he would actually hold me to it, only to realise he hadn't followed me in. When I walked back, he was holding the whole queue up at the cashier's desk, shouting, Vaughan, sort me out. <laughs> but having got to know Mel, uh, her friends, her family, and looking at Mel today, I can safely say it was the best investment I have ever made. So to conclude, will Australia and Mel be lucky to receive Simon in return? Well, he is unlikely to fix the radiator if it leaks. <laughs> there is more. Uh, and he is certainly not to going to progress any form of scientific research at the local university. But what you do have is my best mate. The kind of guy who will never let you down, always listens to your problems, puts his friends and families first, and was one of the funniest blokes I've ever met. All of Simon's friends... <laughs> mm, debatable. Uh, all of Simon's friends and family miss him greatly after he moves. We have shared a lot of good laughs together, but we know there is no one better for Simon than Mel, and we all wish them the very best of luck and happiness in their future together. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could be upstanding and toast Mel and Simon, the bride and groom. Every day I'm shuffling.
Jesus is a Mr. and Mrs. Jones. No more, no more, we can go. 